We are closing to the end of a, of a regulatory cycle. Um, in uh, next month uh, at the G20 summit in, uh, in Buenos Aires, the, the, the FSB chair, the chair of the Financial Stability Board, will uh, report on 10 years of, financial, of global financial re-regulation. Um, and I think it's fair to say that uh, a lot has been done, uh, an awful lot has been done in terms of uh, 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 producing and enforcing a global rule book uh, uh, for banks and for non-banks, uh, but uh, coordination on crisis management has remained a little bit the elephant in the room. Uh, lots, of good, uh, lots of good ideas have been proposed, uh, crisis management groups and the like, uh, but it's largely untested. Uh, so uh, it's good to have that discussion. Um, and looking forward, I think it's also fair to say that uh, dark uh, clouds have been gathering over uh, multilateral cooperation. So the clouds have been settling over uh, trade cooperation, mostly, but uh, they've been uh, casting their shadow also over financial regulation. Um, and uh, it's an important discussion looking forward whether we can uphold the kind of uh, international cooperation that, that we've had uh, over the last 10 years uh, on financial uh, regulation. And uh, my last remark is that listening carefully to the uh, discussion this morning, um, I think one, one thing came clear to me uh, that um, cooperation on, uh, on, uh, on bank uh, uh, crisis uh, is even more difficult than macro cooperation as we've known it in the past, say, uh, on balance of payment crisis uh, uh, and, uh, and uh, global imbalances. Uh, because it has an es essentially a fiscal dimension, uh, and that was uh, a little bit also the discussion in the last panel. So as long as, as taxpayers will be the, the residual uh, risk bearers uh, in, uh, in, uh, in bank resolution, uh, and, uh, and since obviously the, the perimeter of fiscal responsibility is national and, and there is no such thing as a global fiscal authority, uh, that will make any kind of cooperation on, uh, on banking crisis very difficult. And one, one could even argue that even when it comes to private money, when, even when, when you have bail-in, uh, vested interests also play out at a local level, uh, and that also makes cooperation difficult. So there, there may not even be a, a, a big difference between bail-out and bail-in in that respect. So um, uh, with that, uh, let me open the discussion. I'm not uh, presenting, introducing any of the speakers that are very well known, uh, and uh, we'll start uh, with uh, the presentation by Barry, uh, who will give us the the global view. Thank you, Benoit. I'm going to um, focus on, on macroeconomic and financial market cooperation, or, or lack thereof, and, and leave the issues of cooperation in, in managing banking crises and uh, bank resolution to others. Um, specifically, I'm going to discuss the elephant in the room, so if the room is cooperative crisis management. Um, the elephant is Donald Trump. Um, and my conclusion is not uh, surprising that there is significantly reduced scope for cooperative crisis management in the age of Trump. First, recall that uh, an important part of the response to the global financial crisis was cooperation on fiscal stimulus. Gordon Brown famously assembled the G20 countries in London in uh, February of 2009, where they committed to his so-called trillion dollar plan. The reality, of course, was that much of the trillion dollars was made up of national commitments already agreed, but some was new. Uh, uh, the approach recognized that fiscal stimulus had costs as well as benefits, where the costs came in the form of higher future indebtedness and um, less scope for further stimulus down the road, and the benefits were likely to be uh, inadequately internalized given uh, the positive spillovers of uh, fiscal stimulus across borders. So in the absence of the kind of agreement that was reached in London in February of 2009, there would have been a free, free rider problem and under provision of uh, stabilizing uh, uh, fiscal policies. Trump's Accession makes an analogous agreement harder. Uh, on his watch, the United States has already shot most of its fiscal bullets. Its large deficit and heavier debt raised the costs of uh, further fiscal stimulus down the road. Additional stimulus will further raise the trade deficit, other things equal, and anything that raises the trade deficit will be frowned on by the Trump administration. 
I'm aware of, of the inconsistency uh, between my comments on past f U.S. fiscal policy and future U.S. fiscal policy, but inconsistency is indeed one of the hallmarks uh, of Trump administration policy. Trump is likely to, uh, to view recovery from a global crisis like global trade as a zero-sum game, uh, which leads to me to include that his appointees will not be enthusiastic participants in a process that smacks of multilateralism, much less one that follows in the footsteps uh, of the likes of Gordon Brown and, and Barack Obama. Secondly, um, G20 countries successfully uh, avoided beggar thy neighbor, neighbor trade policies in the 2008-2009 crisis. Uh, there is likely to be rather less reluctance to resort to protectionism on the part of the United States uh, this time around. And I think the protectionist temptation will be stronger to the extent that there will have been less fiscal stimulus. Uh, in the 1930s, Douglas Irwin and I showed in, in an article about 10 years ago, recourse to protectionism was greatest in countries that did least to stabilize and, and stimulate their economies through uh, normal monetary and fiscal means, and which therefore felt compelled as a result to resort to tariffs and quotas in order to bottle up uh, the resulting fixed lump of demand. Third, Charles Goodhart alluded to this uh, earlier, there will be more criticism uh, of Federal Reserve swap lines. Uh, already in 2010, some members uh, of the US Congress, misunderstanding the nature of those swaps, criticized the Fed for giving away to foreigners the hard-earned tax dollars uh, uh, of US residents. Uh, this president, I think, is even less uh, restrained in criticizing the Fed. He is fixated on having foreigners shoulder their fair share of the burden, whether we're talking about the costs of NATO or uh, something ap else. He's apt, therefore, to see Fed swap lines as a giveaway. We can hope uh, that the Fed ignoring this criticism and uh, the implied threat to its independence will go ahead uh, and do the right thing anyway. I, I personally find it hard to um, think about exactly how the, how the Fed will respond to this pressure. Uh, uh, so far, we have seen Trump appoint uh, strong personalities who understand the arguments for the provision of liquidity uh, in a crisis to the board. Um, on the other hand, there's an argument that they all, all already receiving flack for some of their other actions they will husband their more limited uh, room for maneuver for domestic counterparties. So uh, it, it, it clearly is uncertain uh, how these political dynamics will play out. Um, I've argued elsewhere that um, Trump's efforts to, to weaponize the dollar will encourage other countries to move away from it over time, uh, and that they will do so uh, at least on the margin uh, the result will be to increase the importance of euro-denominated funding rel relative to uh, dollar-denominated funding, and therefore the value of ECB swap lines. So uh, a logical question to ask at this point is whether the ECB will um, step into the breach or whether the central bank uh, will, feel, uh, will, will hesitate, feel reluctance to put its balance sheet at risk. In 2008, uh, if I... Um, recall uh, how things developed, uh, the ECB provided initially euro swaps to Hungary, Poland, uh, and, 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 and Latvia, countries outside the uh, euro area, of course, but only against high quality collateral. And the central banks in question had limited amounts of high quality collateral, which uh, constrained um, their ability to secure euro swaps. I think that changed in, in 2009. The, the collateral requirements were liberalized and, 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 and so forth. But I think there remains the question of um, whether the ECB will be prepared to provide uh, uncollateralized or likely collateralized swap, swap lines to central banks outside the euro area, and for that matter, central banks outside uh, Europe. <laughs>
uh, how will the ECB respond to requests for dollar funding from Mexico, Brazil, South Korea, and Singapore? Um, some, some would say that, that the ECB's reluctance to assume this kind of uh, balance sheet risk is understandable, given the absence of a Eurozone treasury to recapitalize it. Uh, the member states, shareholders in the bank could, in principle, recapitalize it. But then there's the, 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 the question of how such an action would be received in Berlin. Finally, uh, there's the issue of uh, cooperative crisis management by the International Monetary Fund, which played a, a, a large role in managing the, the global financial crisis starting in, in 2008. So far, uh, I think the Trump administration has seen the fund as a useful agent in dealing with crises in Argentina and Pakistan. The issue is whether it will still see the IMF as a useful agent when uh, the, the U.S. government has to contribute additional resources financially, and whether uh, in the absence of such a contribution, IMF resources will be adequate for the next crisis. Um, a substantial fraction of the fund's resources come from the new arrangements to borrow uh, to expire in 2022, and bilateral uh, borrowing lines with uh, individual member states scheduled to expire uh, in 2020. Um, renewing those arrangements, ideally turning them into a permanent pool of resources, will require agreement between the, the United States and China. And in the age of Trump, the United States and China don't agree on, on, on very much. Uh, in particular, any discussion of uh, a larger permanent pool of resources, larger quotas, will revive arguments for, for raising the shares of China and, and other emerging markets in the fund. In turn, this will threaten uh, the U.S. veto and, and, and predictably uh, elicit Washington's opposition. Um, the one statement I, I, I've seen by Secretary Mnuchin about the adequacy of, of the fund's resources uh, was basically they're adequate, and he didn't quite specify whether he meant now or in 2020 or in 2022, but I think that uh, blunt statement does sing signal a reluctance on the part of, of, of the administration to consider um, uh, quota reform. So what happens then? Um, uh, other parts of the world uh, uh, will respond by developing regional assistance me me mechanisms through which they themselves can exert more control. So China has already done this through its uh, swap lines, 32 in number last time I counted with foreign central banks. Uh, it's uh, enlisted its state banks to provide an emergency loan to Pakistan. It participates in the Chiang Mai Initiative multilateralization. I think all those steps can be understood as responses to the fact that it is underrepresented uh, in terms of uh, governance and, and influence in the IMF. And you will know that other regions, starting with, uh, with Europe, have responded uh, in a similar way. So I think this regionalization of the multilateral or, or, or global international lender of last resort function is more general. What does this mean for uh, cooperative crisis management? Well, it creates a problem. The fund could, in principle, attempt to work together with uh, regional lenders capable of contributing additional resources when uh, the IMF itself is resource constrained. But uh, think back to the Troika, the obvious question is what happens when the IMF board disagrees with the regional entities in question about substantive uh, policy questions. Uh, when that happened uh, in, in, in Greece, um, might be a little strong to say cooperation between uh, the European institutions and the fund broke down, but it was uh, rather considerably weakened. The fundamental problem, uh, as I see it, and this will be my, my last point, is that the international lender of last resort function has become politicized, overly politicized. Members are, are reluctant to expand the resources and the powers of the IMF because they worry, for example, that it will be used to advance the Trump administration's America First policies, 
or alternatively, they worry that the institution will be hamstrung, it will be immobilized by a president skeptical of multilateral institutions and engagements. They worry that European governments acting together can also, also possess a veto and can also shape IMF policies uh, to their advantage. The general problem is that political influence makes it hard for the IMF to credibly commit to desirable policies. So you will recall in 2009, uh, in response to the perceptions of the, the bailout problem, the fund adopted an exceptional access policy prohibiting the, the extension of exceptionally large loans to countries whose, whose debts were of questionable sustainability, but in one year later, in 2010, when the stability of French and German banks hung in the balance, political pressure from European governments caused the fund to disregard its just established uh, exceptional access policy and give Greece the single largest loan in the history of, uh, of the institution. I think um, politiz politicization is equally a problem for regional and, and, and bilateral arrangements. If Pakistan is unable to repay the rescue loan it received from China, uh, Beijing may demand compensation in the form of a 99-year lease on a strategic port as it did in the case of uh, Sri Lanka. Um, I, I, I think in, in if, if you're prepared to engage in a little bit of blue sky thinking, there is a solution to these problems, the same one used to limit political interference with national monetary policy and national lender of last resort operations, which is to delegate decisions to an independent management committee like the Monetary Policy Committee of an independent central bank, which would have a mandate agreed by the member countries, uh, um, an in independent management team serving long terms in office, taking decisions consistent with that mandate without undue interference by creditor countries preoccupied by, say, the financial conditions uh, of their banks, and such a, a, a officials operating in the context of, of such a setup could credibly commit to time consistent policies like adhering to the 2009 policy on uh, exceptional access. So all this is really blue sky thinking. All of these issues are fraught. Uh, I'm aware I'm on a panel with Paul Tucker who has pointed up the problems with delegating comparable functions at the national level, um, but at the end of Paul's book, I think he concludes that independence for the central bank, while fraught, remains the least worst option. It's the worst option except for all the others. So I, I, I would argue that for those concerned with um, IMF policy, it's time to at least discuss going down this road, whether the Trump administration, much less foreign governments, will uh, agree to such discussions is, is, of course, another question. Thank you very much, Barry. Uh, Patrick, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me to this uh, wonderful conference. Uh, ten years after Lehman Brothers, um, you know, we have multiple conferences going on, but uh, this is really, uh, I think, one of the finest, uh, uh, certainly, um, you know, uh, from, from the ones that I've seen. So it's really a pleasure to be here. Um, so it, I'm on the last panel. Uh, uh, a lot of things have been said, and a lot of things that I was planning to say have already been said. So. Uh, uh, I hope you'll, uh, you'll won't mind if I repeat uh, some of the key points that have already been made. Uh, if I can bring something to the table is that I will uh, have a somewhat narrow focus uh, on um, systemically important uh, financial institutions uh, and, uh, and the uh, uh, issues of uh, international cooperation in that context and I will have you know, some colorful slides, and I will have uh, 
uh, to begin with a couple of uh, um, provocative uh, quotes. I, uh, very few people have been very uh, people have been very restrained on that front, but I decided the last panel maybe uh, I could uh, afford to uh, be a, a little bit less restrained. So here's a quote from Tim Geithner's book about uh, Lehman Brothers. So what's the point I want to make here? Um, you have national authorities making decisions, um, but these decisions, when it comes to um, systemically important institutions, global systemically important institutions, have global ramifications. So that's one basic problem you have here. Uh, often these national uh, authorities take a narrow view uh, of the interests of the country they're, uh, they're uh, representing, and they're not really looking at the global uh, ramifications. Yeah, here's another uh, uh, quote, uh, again, about Lehman Brothers. Um, of course, Lehman Brothers, uh, you know, it, uh, it was an uh, unintended failure. Uh, the plan was to have a, a, if you want to purchase an assumption deal uh, between Barclays and Lehman, uh, and, uh, and that failed for uh, similar reasons. Um, that uh, the authority um, responsible for helping the deal uh, go through uh, decided uh, uh, no, right? That's Alistair, Alistair Darling's quote here. Uh, now, there's a question uh, whether he even had the legal authority to do it, but I, I don't want to go into this. Anyway, so, um, um, you know, how do you uh, overcome these problems? Uh, and uh, especially when it comes to systemically important banks, this slide here is just to uh, tell you, not that you, uh, most of you need to be reminded, but that uh, systemically important banks, we're, we're talking about roughly 30 institutions, 30 plus institutions. That seems like a very small number. Uh, uh, Mathias Duatripon mentioned eight for the Eurozone. Um, you might say, well, that's a very confined and narrow problem, but actually when you look at the, uh, their footprint, it's uh, where the action is, I would argue. And uh, let me here comment on, uh, uh, on the previous panel, uh, something um, I think that, uh, you know, a, a, a reaction I had to some of the comment, uh, to some of the presentations. Um, most of you probably would not know this or not, not remember, but, um, New Century Financial uh, was the second largest subprime mortgage lender in the US. It filed for Chapter 11 in April 2007. Nobody paid any attention, okay? It was not a systemically important institution. Um, while the crisis was unfolding in the US, hundreds of small and medium-sized banks were resolved under purchase and assumption. Nobody paid any attention. It never made uh, the, the front pages. Uh, so the action is the big banks that have actually grown bigger as a result of the crisis. So that's where we need to uh, pay attention. The problem is the two fundamental, well, actually I would say three fundamental problems. First problem is these are not easy institutions to resolve. Okay, so here what you see is the, you know, how organizationally complex these systemically important institutions are. So, for example, you know, Morgan Stanley, even though he did a, a, a made a big effort to reduce the number of subsidiaries, you know, it still has, in 2016, over 2,500 subsidiaries. And, you know, same is true for Goldman Sachs, uh, uh, JP Morgan make a bigger effort, but still, uh, you know, uh, over a thousand subsidiaries. Uh, organizational complexity. How do you resolve an institution with such organizational complexity? That's the first big problem. The second problem uh, is uh, uh, one that was particularly important for Lehman, and that is, uh, uh, has to do with uh, qualified financial contracts. Uh, those are uh, derivative swaps and repos. Uh, the problem with qualified financial contracts is that uh, uh, there's an exemption, there's a carve-out uh, in U.S. bankruptcy law. There's an exemption uh, that uh, um, the counterparties to those uh, um, contracts, they can come and collect collateral immediately. There are cross-default provisions, etc. So when Lehman f uh, filed for bankruptcy, uh, 
the minute uh, the, the news was out, uh, um, counterparties, derivative swaps counterparties around the world came in and collected their collateral. A lot of it was cash collateral. Lehman was immediately drained. It could no longer operate. Within five days, the, the US bankruptcy judge had to agree to the sale of the broker-dealer arm of Lehman at 10 times less the price than Barclays was willing to pay five days after, into, the, into the bankruptcy. Okay, so that's the, that's the problem. Harvey Miller, he was the uh, lawyer representing Lehman in bankruptcy. He said uh, this caused a massive disruption of value. Now, of course, you know, he might be self-interested here, but FDIC, they did a study, you know, how would Lehman have been resolved under, uh, under the new, under FDIC receivership or uh, ordinary liquidation authority? They found that basically, uh, if it had done that way, uh, Lehman would have lost 3% of, uh, uh, of its value, not more like 60%. Okay, so that's the problem. So if complexity, uh, you have uh, you know, uh, some very uh, uh, major specificities uh, uh, that are tied to these uh, global financial institutions, so what do you do? And here's really, I think, uh, uh, one major positive news that has come out uh, of the crisis. And if, if, in fact, I mean, I will, I will strike a note of uh, optimism. There's been a lot of uh, pessimistic talk, but here we've really seen some very good developments. And the, and the new idea is to say, well, okay, if it's complex, uh, um, let's go for uh, the essence. Let's do something simple. And that, that something simple means let's only focus on resolution at the holding company level. Let's forget about the affiliates. Affiliates, we're not going to touch, but we're going to intervene at the holding company level. Okay, so that's what's called single point of entry. And here I'm really uh, embarrassed to uh, pitch this because Paul Tucker is the inventor of uh, uh, this idea and have promoted it successfully uh, at the G20 level. Okay, so how does this work? Well, uh, the ideal setting is as follows. Think of Lehman here under single point of entry. Uh, so it's holding companies based in the US uh, it, uh, it has, of course, a, a very large uh, uh, U.S. affiliate, and then it has a, a very large U.K. affiliate. I mean, this is a simplified picture here. And then what happens is that if you have losses, uh, um, you know, the holding company on its own is not going to incur losses. It's the operating affiliates that are incurring losses. So you have a loss in an operating affiliate, let's say in the U.S. operating affiliate. What happens is that uh, that loss gets moved up and absorbed by the holding company. So uh, first in line are the credit, the, the shareholders of the holding company. They take a hit, and if the shareholders uh, uh, can't absorb the loss, the next thing in line is long-term debt. Okay, that's been uh, referred to since as uh, uh, um, uh, TLAC. Uh, I'll come to that in, uh, on the next slide. But the, the idea is wherever the loss is, uh, uh, occurs, whether it occurs in the US or in the UK or anywhere, anywhere else, the loss gets moved up to the holding company level and only the holding company gets resolved. Okay, so of course, this only works if there's en enough uh, uh, loss absorbing capacity at the holding company level. And so this is where uh, TLAC comes in. Um, and you can see we've added a lot of TLAC on top of uh, uh, the um, usual equity regulatory capital. Uh, it's, uh, it's, you know, a TLAC plus uh, um, uh, equity regulatory capital, it's on a risk-weighted uh, uh, asset basis, uh, it's 20% uh, plus, okay? It's a pretty big uh, uh, number, and, and so the idea is uh, that probably that should be enough of a cushion. And now, there have been a lot of debates, I'm not going to go into this, as whether TLAC should be in the form of equity or in terms of long-term debt. The choice has been to go for long-term debt here, and so I've, I'm, sh uh, sh I'm showing you here in blue uh, the bail-inable uh, debt part. Okay, now international cooperation, how does it uh, enter into international cooperation? Well, um, it's already a form of cooperation if you say we're only going to uh, intervene at the holding company level of, uh, of, the, of the group. That's a form of cooperation. But uh, um, um, in a way, you would, like to, you, you would like it to stop there. But uh, unfortunately, uh, 
uh, you know, countries want to ring fence, uh, uh, and, and uh, uh, sometimes, you know, moving losses uh, from one jurisdiction to another can, can uh, go against the uh, regulator's interest, and so we have another uh, uh, alternative, which is multiple points of entry, which is shown, uh, what you can see here. That's an inferior model, but it's, that's a constrained model because you have to take into account the constraints of uh, uh, that national regulators face. Uh, that's a point that I make in a paper uh, um, of mine with Martin Oemke that uh, I've built uh, you know, this presentation on. Okay, so that's the, uh, the good uh, news. Uh, I will say more about the good news in a second, but just, uh, just to summarize, good news is we've, got, we've, we've focused on a resolution model uh, for the, the institutions that really matter that could conceivably work. Uh, we have a model, uh, it, uh, it's been well thought through. Now, uh, uh, there's, there's the TLAC, TLAC, there's been an agreement to increase TLAC, all of that's good news. <coughs> Now, what are the potential issues around how this might work? Uh, well, we, again, here I'm, I'm maybe just repeating things that we've heard before. Still, uh, one of the most important open question remains, how do you combine liquidity support with resolution? Um, now, here I have a little anecdote uh, to say about uh, AIG. Okay, so this uh, uh, echoes some other point that was made earlier. So AIG had the full backstop of the U.S. government. Treasury and the Fed stepped in and said, we're going to bail out completely AIG. Now, you might have thought that with the full backstop of the U.S. government, there would be no longer any run on AIG. But the surprise of the authorities was that the run into AIG continued, even though the backstop was in place. They had to ramp up the, the, the liquidity provision massively. It was in, you know, over $100 billion I mean, in a matter of weeks. So even if you provide a backstop, uh, you can have a run. Okay? And so the point is, what about a global systemically important bank where you have TLAC, you're going to bail in the TLAC. Nobody has said anything about a backstop. How can we be sure that there won't be a run just because, you know, people panic? So the liquidity issue is really uh, central here. And I think here the U.S. has really, and the debate in the U.S. has got, taken the wrong turn. A lot of people have been saying, no, no, we do resolution, we bring it back to solvency, and then the market will provide liquidity through debtor in possession financing. That's the way to go. Restrictions have been put on liquidity provision by, by the Fed. That's, a, that's an area of concern. Uh, I think m much more promising is, the, is the, the view taken in the EU and in the UK, and that is conditional public liquidity. In other words, you do the bail-in, and then conditional bail-in, you provide a full backstop. That, you probably need that just to calm the markets, just to avoid uh, a panic. Okay, what are potentially other, uh, other uh, gaps? Um, well, here's some interesting development. People didn't really trust this model. I mean, a lot of people still don't trust this model. A lot of issues have been raised. Uh, and again, I think the positive news is a lot of these issues have been addressed and, uh, uh, and we, you know, we've perfected uh, uh, the model. So uh, a first uh, concern that came up a lot is uh, that, yeah, you put in place this uh, uh, bail-in option, but will it ever be exercised? Won't people just delay the inevitable, uh, you know, delay things as much as they can, and then we, have, we still have a problem? Another issue is shortfall in TLAC. I think that's probably still an open issue. Um, a third issue uh, that people raise is, well, won't creditors challenge? This just came up earlier in the presentation by uh, Mathias de Watripon is won't creditors challenge uh, uh, the, the, the bail-in decision? Won't they say, well, actually, I thought I was uh, uh, first in line against maybe the creditors of some, some affiliate, and now you're telling me I'm, I'm first in line. Won't there be creditor actions? How do you deal with creditor actions like that? That's an issue. Uh, the uh, other issue is, have we solved the QFC problem? 
shouldn't we be worried about cross-default provisions? Uh, and um, on those issues, uh, so the, the QFC uh, issue, the, the creditor challenge issue, and the, and the risk of delaying uh, resolution, Overall, I think it's good news, at least when it comes to the US. Uh, I'll show you so, uh, uh, that in a second on the next slide. The point is that a lot of stuff has been done to try and address these issues. So for example, on the QFC uh, counterparties uh, uh, exercising cross-default provisions, there is a new ISDA protocol in place now that actually prevents that. Um, so that's a good thing. Um, the risk in delaying resolution, well, there is now uh, a plan in place for all the large banks uh, under their resolution plans that's being agreed with the Fed. Uh, I'll show you that in a second. And then on credit for challenges, again, that's been resolved by creating a intermediate holding company, funding company, just underneath the, uh, the parent holding company. Um, what remains open is more uh, the coordination and liquidity provision. Uh, I mentioned that earlier, but let me just add uh, uh, an important issue when it comes to coordination. Take a, take a bank like HSBC. HSBC has a, a large affiliate in the UK and a large affiliate in Hong Kong. Okay? Well, who's going to be the lender providing liquidity if one of the, those affiliates goes under? If the Hong Kong affiliate goes under, will the Bank of England step in? I don't think these issues have been uh, uh, fully uh, resolved. Uh, and then there's a risk of contagion. Uh, uh, that is always a possibility. Okay, but here's the good news. So uh, I've just, um, so I've been reading the new resolution plan. So resolution plans, all the major uh, uh, banks in the US have to file a resolution plan. There's a public plan and there's a private plan. I can only see the public plans uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm taking out you know, two figures out of the 2017 plans, all right? So, those are really worth reading. This is very interesting reading. These plans are incredibly sophisticated. A lot of work has gone into this. Hundreds of pages uh, uh, of uh, presentations, at least for the uh, JP Morgan plan. So here's just one picture I thought would be interesting. Okay, so all these banks now have something like this. And so what you see here is a, a progression in time from, you know, uh, from bad to worse. So you have business as usual, uh, then you have a loss that uh, uh, occurs, then you have a stress period, uh, then that's followed if the stress period uh, uh, doesn't help resolve the loss by a recovery period, uh, and if that doesn't work, you're going to have a filing preparation period, and then all eventually, you know, everything goes south, you're going to have the resolution weekend uh, and then uh, the post-resolution uh, period. All of these phases are carefully laid out. Now, there is no other company, non-financial company in the world, that has that kind of detailed plan. So this is absolutely exceptional. Uh, and then here, here's another uh, uh, slide from Goldman Sachs, okay? So it's the same thing, but they're uh, emphasizing different things. But what's interesting here is, you know, even communication has been carefully planned. So you're gonna have to have communication internally among all different affiliates, what is about to happen, and you're gonna to have to have in, uh, communication externally. All of this has been carefully laid out, vetted, uh, and uh, you know, may, maybe it won't work, maybe it will always, always be bad surprises, but a lot of effort has gone into this. Let me say that Goldman Sachs plan says for 2017, Goldman Sachs says that by now, Goldman Sachs has 30% plus of uh, TLAC. Okay, so it's very well positioned to absorb, uh, you know, very significant losses. And, uh, and, and here, uh, just, the, you know, the, having, the, having this communication go on, it's very healthy. The, the, obviously, the big banks, they compare their resolution plans. Uh, they, you know, they, they learn from each other. Uh, and, uh, and then there's the U.S. specificity, which also is quite interesting. The U.S. thought initially you can't resolve these big banks under Chapter 11 bankruptcy, under regular bankruptcy. That's impossible. So they invented this other procedure, ordinary liquidation authority. Problem is banks don't like it. Okay, so then you use that as a stick. You say, okay, show me you can do it in Chapter 11. And that's where these resolution plans come in. 
That's where the Fed comes in and stress tests these plans and says, yeah, it may work, may, it may not work. And a lot of these plans have been rejected over time, but you know, in 2017, a lot of, uh, a lot of progress. So that's what I wanted to uh, uh, highlight. So just in, uh, to conclude, uh, uh, US systemically important banks have never been more prepared. I think that's probably the main conclusion that I want to draw here. However, you know, will it work as intended? Well, we never know, it's never been tested. And that's why maintaining a lender of last resort that can step in uh, uh, and provide the backstop, provide insurance, is very important. Now, of course, you know, we have a very well uh, uh, structured, well uh, uh, um, regulated banking sector now that can take a hit, but maybe uh, problems will come from outside and that's, you know, that's something you cannot fully predict and that obviously this, the, the system isn't set up for that. Let me, let me stop here. Thank you very much, Patrick. That was really uh, illuminating for those of us who know the U.S. system less well. Uh, very well done. Uh, and the last presentation is by Paul before we move to the discussion. Thank you, Benoit. It's a, it's a real delight to be here. It's, it's, as some of you know, I always enjoy speaking in the country of my, of my wife. Um, I, 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 can I also echo Patrick's comments? That I think this is a terrific um, conference. I, I've been at many um, 10 years after conferences on both sides of the Atlantic over the past few months. They're, they're mainly used as an opportunity for people to proclaim what a brilliant job they did in the crisis and to, and to, and to throw dense smoke around the mistakes that they have made. And I think you ought to be, if I may say so, to be applauded for um, completely avoiding that kind of, of atmosphere and, and bringing academia together with current policy makers and a few clapped out policy um, makers. Um, I'm going to make two preliminary um, points, perhaps three, and then four substantive um, points. So I think that the, this question of cross-border cooperation in crisis management, and I'm saddened that Huon has listened, left the room, um, has been traveling over the past 10 years from less reliance on what could be called soft law and towards hard law, or at least hard wiring. And the, the reasons for that, I think, are, are sound. They, the, the two finest crisis managers I knew in central banking were Jerry Corrigan of the New York Fed, which is kind of almost the last time the New York Fed was the New York Fed, and Eddie George um, of the Bank of England. And they, they not only were each individual, in, individually truly great crisis managers, they were also personally very close and professionally very close. And in a banking crisis that occurred during the early 1990s across many, affecting many countries, Jerry phoned Eddie and told him that they would not cooperate. And the reason I know that is that in US speak, I was the chief of staff to the governor of the Bank of England at the time, and I was on the, um, the call. The other, the other jurisdiction who, at that point, um, declined to cooperate was, was Hong Kong, which formerly was actually still, to use deliberately old-fashioned word, a colony of the UK. So it was quite something that there was a breakdown in cooperation between the Bank of England and the New York Fed, who virtually invented central bank cooperation, and between London um, and, and Hong Kong. The, the second thing that I would say is that in these, crisis, in these conferences about 10 years on, where people have been kind of um, cast, issuing smoke, there has been quite a lot of disparagement of other regimes. Um, perhaps particularly in the states of Europe, to some extent in the states of London. Um, I've been at at least one event in Europe where the US has been criticized. Well, this isn't encouraging in terms of reliance on ex-post cooperation depend turning 
on, on soft um, law. And the third preliminary comment I would make, and it is certainly addressed to some of you, is that we absolutely must get away from at one end of the spectrum, this hasn't been said by anybody here, we have solved too big to fail, or at the other end of the spectrum, none of this will work. For anyone that's actually been involved in a sizable crisis, it's better thought of as circles of hell. Um, and there are worse circles of hell than others. The, the, the achievement of my generation of policymakers was to avoid being in as bad a circle of hell as the 1930s, but actually it's possible to do considerably better than that. And the metric should be, I think the test should be, for all of the things we're discussing, is that whether in dealing with um, the President of the United States, Chancellor of Germany, or the Prime Minister of the UK, and obviously got more experience of the latter, it's whether they are left with a realistic choice. It's when you go into the room and explain to them what their options are, is the only responsible thing to do to say, you now have no option other than to put public money into this situation. Or alternatively, can you say, actually, you could do that, or you've got a choice, you could do this other thing. And if we have time, I'll say something about using bail-in technique for a systemic crisis when a number of firms are in um, distress at the same time. So, um, on to the four substantive points of which there are two that are, I will say more about than, than the third and fourth. So, over the past 12 months, perhaps 15 months, two leading central bankers, both of whom at the time sat at the core table in Basel, the, the G14 table, said that progress on um, bail-in and resolution and so on was going tremendously well, but they were still worried about the cross-border element. And apart from my juvenile frustration around that, my adult concern about it was that although they'd been there when the policy was approved, they seemed to have forgotten that the bail-in policy was precisely um, devised and, and approved in the context of thinking about um, cross-border um, coordination and problems. Frankly, what was in my mind was Goldman Sachs International and Morgan Stanley International, given how large they are um, in, in London. And, and the, way, the way that the um, idea works, and here I want to add to something that Patrick said, is as, as follows. You have a subsidiary, it can be, can be here in Brussels, very big, um, globally active holding company in the United States. The subsidiary gets into distress. The host supervisor, resolution authority, doesn't matter which, presses the switch that effectively converts the local the bonds issued by the subsidiary up to the holding company converts those into equity or writes them down. It doesn't much matter technically which of those it is, and so sends the loss to the holding company. That's exactly what um, Patrick um, um, described. Here's the point I want to add. To, to, ha to have that set up, four people need to agree to the issue of a bond with those terms by the subsidiary to the holding company. The board of the subsidiary, the board of the holding company, the regular, regulator of the subsidiary, and the regulator of the holding company. Put the boards on one side. The, the home country regulators will not agree to this if they think the host authorities are crazy and will be pressing this button and sending, and sending losses up to the holding um, company in a premature or trigger-happy fashion. Um, or, alternatively, slightly more sophisticated um, version of it, if the home country authorities are concerned that the host country authorities will become indifferent to supervising and, and monitoring the risks in the subsidiary because they can press um, the button and send the losses, the excess losses, the losses exceeding equity up to the holding company. So those will be the circumstances in which the home country authorities will say, no, we are not allowing this structure. The host country authorities will decline to um, um, adopt this structure um, if the following two conditions obtain. That the first is that they believe that the subsidiary operating in this part of the world, domiciled in, in Brussels, um, 
even if the losses can be sent up to the holding company, will not be viable on a standalone basis unless the rest of the group is healthy and operating. This is essentially the distinction between, this drives the distinction between groups that are subject to SPE and groups that are subject to MPE. So that's the first condition. And secondly, that they do not believe that the home country um, has both a regime that can do group level, holding company level resolution effectively um, and the will to do so in the right circumstances. Now, what is the point of saying all of, all of that? It's that it's all absolutely upfront at the point of which um, approval is given by the host authorities and the home authorities for the inter what's now called internal TLAC to be issued by um, the subsidiary to the holding company on, on the terms that Patrick has described. And if either the host authority or the home authority says no, and it would be very peculiar, I think, if no one ever said no, um, but when no is said, then the host authority and the home authority know that the group has to be restructured and a degree of ring fencing um, needs to um, go on. And so this essentially avoids Eddie George and, and Jerry Corrigan discovering in the midst of the BCCI crisis that they won't cooperate. Instead, it, 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 it brings the crunch point to a period of financial peacetime and forces them to reveal um, to themselves and to the rest of the world and in public whether or not it is possible for them to coordinate. Now, for those of you that are in the research business, particularly the applied economics research business, um, a, a really useful project um, as the time passes will be to look at um, going through the big top 20, 30 firms in the world um, in, for which groups have these internal TLAC structures been permitted and for which have they not been um, permitted and if that is not transparent to the world to scream like fury first of all at research conferences um, and then in Vox EU pieces. So that's, that's the first thing I want to say. The, the second thing concerns liquidity. I don't know whether Elka is still here, but um, I think she meant me when she said Andrew. Everyone afterwards in the Bank of England was called Andrew. She, she said that um, we might have been naive in when I steered this stuff through all the various committees, not thinking about the fact that there would be a liquidity run. Well, I mean, I, I don't doubt that there are some mistakes, but that certainly had been envisaged, and that's why later on the Bank of England announced that there would be a liquidity line for use in... in, in um, in resolution. The bigger point is the one made by Benoit. What happens if the subsidiary, or indeed the holding company, the whole of the group, has been um, returned to solvency because there's been enough TLAC in place, but there still isn't um, enough collateral that's eligible at the relevant central banks in order to, to fund the, um, the distressed and other affiliated entities? And this comes back, I think, to a point made by Jean Thoreau um, in an earlier session. I myself, not just in the context of resolution, in fact, have been moving towards the position that a sensible regulatory policy for the largest internationally active firms in the world would be to require all, sh all short-term liabilities to be covered by assets eligible um, for discount at I'm going to say initially, the central bank at their discounted value. And there's a lot to be said about that. Actually, it effectively becomes the de facto um, equity capital policy for, um, for banks. So if you don't do that, those of you who are in office, I think you will tumble into the question that you're describing. And if you, and if you tumble into the, to that, to that problem with one of the big 20 um, um, firms in the world, I do not think you will have an excuse. Um, um, to be able to get you out of it, because actually this is a solvable problem. This isn't as, as hard as, as solving some of the other um, problems. The other thing is, is, is swap lines, and this will bridge to my third point where I want to pick up a couple of things um, that, that Barry said. The first is, if, if you, if you um, do not have a swap line from the central banks of issue 
of the currencies in which your biggest banks and dealers are operating, then you should not allow those banks and dealers to have significant liquidity mismatches um, in, those, in those currencies. And nor is, nor is that, at the moment, coded um, into um, policy or into IMF surveillance. But again, it wouldn't be hard um, to do um, that. I mean, well, actually a swap line or foreign exchange reserves that, that, that are adequate to cover. Again, for the, for the most systemic, as they're now called, banks and dealers, all of the relevant liabilities um, and um, short-term liabilities and, and so on. So this brings me um, to, because this starts to shade into um, macro type issues. I, I think Barry described the, the atmosphere around swap lines in the United States completely accurately. It is my own belief, but this is a predic prediction rather than a description of the world, is that we will live to see the, United, the Federal Reserve and the People's Bank of China competing in the provision of swap lines as part of a geopolitical um, strategy. I think that as China's power increases and possibly in slower motion as India's power increases, I think that Congress will switch from the stance they've had over the last quarter of a century to one where if the People's Bank are wandering around the world offering swap lines, which I think up to a point is going on already, well then we need to underpin the use of the dollar um, by relaxing the soft political constraints on the Federal Reserve um, offering um, swap lines. But more broadly, I think Barry is absolutely right to describe the, sh the perspective shift in the tectonic plates of international cooperation at the highest level. Ev everybody in this room, um, particularly policymakers, have, have worked in a world where three spheres were in parallel. The world of of geopolitical strategy, foreign policy, and security policy, the world of trade policy, and the world of international, the international monetary and financial system. Um, at the great geopolitical changes, these, these things come together. And I think that those of you that are in policy institutions, but particularly in the international policy institutions, need to think about how you will um, adapt to this. On, on Barry's idea of a technocratic committee at the, um, at the top of the um, IMF, I, I, I can see that that actually may be a solution. Um, I mean, I'm thinking through similar things at the moment, Barry. I can see that that actually may be a solution to the, to the looming problem of the United States not agreeing to China being the largest quota holder um, at the fund. But I think if that step were taken, if that ended up being the solution, then consistent with my book on elected power, that management committee would have to have, be subject to a rather more precise mandate and, and tougher constraints than is the board of the IMF and the IMFC um, at the moment, to effectively make goal policy as well as, as, well as means um, policy. But the, the other thing I would say is that for those of you that, that are exploring solutions to this, I think a really useful mental test is do not, do not, in the sense of you need to be robust to, to a tectonic shift in the international regime. Do, do not adopt policies um, on the assumption that the United States will remain the hegemon forever, but instead adopt policies which you'll be content with if the United States remains the hegemon, that you'll be content with if there's a top table of three, or you'll be content with if there is a top table of one and it's, and it's China. And to give an example of that, I mean, it means being more modest about extraterritorial policies than the United States has been in financial regulation over the past 20 years. And it would be, mean being considerably more transparent in the BIS and the IMF about meetings with bankers. 
because at the moment we think, well, it's all right, we, 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 we know all of those bankers and we'll, we, we ignore them mainly anyway, whereas we won't feel the same, actually, if the meetings are with large institutions from Asia, which we find harder to, to, to gauge. So I think that the techie issues over the previous two sessions and that Patrick and I have touched on are absolutely going to merge with the broader issues that Barry um, has raised. And I think the challenge, um, Benoit, for you and Peter and, and others is to ensure um, that this isn't a collision. Thank you, Paul. So we now move to discussion, with, starting with uh, Pierre Carlo. Thank you, and let me thank the organizer for inviting me to this very interesting uh, conference, and which is a nice break for me in my current activity as MP. Uh, I'd like to make one point, which is closely related to the last sentence that Paul just made about the US losing its hegemonic sta sta status. And the point is the following. It's a point made yesterday, uh, which says, never waste a good crisis. Someone very important said at some stage, and this has been repeatedly offered in discussion. I agree that crises are occasions that have to be exploited in terms of building on crisis and trying to, uh, to make a better world where crises are less likely to happen. My point is that crises are a good spark spark off mechanism for uh, institution building, but they're only a necessary condition for that. Uh, and indeed, institution building takes a much harder process to take place and conditions to hold before crisis actually turns into institution building. And if one <coughs> take, goes back to the literature on international public choice or international political economy, which was flourishing in the 80s and 90s, yes, I'm that old, uh, one can summarize a number of conditions which uh, scholars of those disciplines identified based on uh, historical experience. So you basically need the following. First of all, you need actors that are preferably few uh, to interact in a post-hegemonic world, where, where, which means there is no single actor able and willing to impose its own view of the world and regimes and support that regime, but you have to come to an agreement which is more or less where we stand today, uh, post-hegemonic situation, where these actors must be willing and able to adjust their domestic policy preferences, which basically means today domestic politics is important but cannot constrain all the decision made at the international level. Second condition, actors have to take a long-term view. Uh, they, have to, they need to have a strategy, but they also need to have time to interact so that they can know each other better and perhaps build some uh, mutual trust, something which we lack a lot of, including in this part of the world nowadays. Third condition is existing institutions must be also used to build up better institutions so that institution building is a uh, it is not a one bank, one bank shot situation, but it's an evolutionary process. And finally, uh, as let me repeat the point, this leads to trust building, which is the, if, uh, including in, it's the official ingredient, the most important ingredient for building up new institutions. So this is my point. Uh, let me elaborate on this point very briefly in the time I've left, looking at two situations. One is, uh, well, the G20 episode. Oh, well, it's, a, it's not an episode, it's a, it's a long phase in international economic political history, uh, which was sparked off in its, as you all know, in its uh, leaders' participation, so the going beyond the finance minister's format, uh, as a consequence of the financial crisis. We all remember what happened then in 2008. There was an immediate response, Barry uh, described that very carefully, uh, which eventually put a demand stop gap to the situation which was feared to be uh, a, a deep recession coming up, which it did not eventually materialize. Yes, yes, we had a big recession, but not such a, as was feared at that stage. But this was it. Let me be provocative. This was basically it. Uh, after the situation stabilized a little bit, there was clearly a pullback situation. Uh, which uh, on the macroeconomic, monetary and fiscal side decided, yes, we have stopped the gap, 
but now let's go back to business as usual. And this was, with hindsight, possibly a mistake, which in some parts of the world was particularly relevant. However, the G20 process did start off as a very ambitious institution building exercise, which eventually grew in terms of agenda setting, in terms of instruments, in terms of bodies involved. Uh, and the G20 eventually produced three main results, uh, which for simplicity's sake I'll summarize as follows. First of all, on the growth agenda, we went back to what I remember being the global imbalances debate before the crisis broke out. This was at a time when the IMF was uh, producing a paper on global imbalances almost every month. I remember that because I was working at the IMF, so we had to read that and, and report back to staff and saying, why did you miss that variable and so forth. Uh, I, I remember one board meeting when uh, Raghu Rajan uh, exposed its usual quarterly slides about the global situation. And then at the end of his presentation, many of us raised their hands and said, why didn't you mention the global imbalances? And he said, I was waiting for you to ask me that because I was so tired of discussing about global imbalances that I thought one for once I would spare you with that. It didn't work. So on the growth agenda, the G20 agreed in principle on having a structured approach where monetary, fiscal, financial, and structural policies would interact according to the, to the different regional settings. Uh, so that they would deliver growth. That did not happen. Growth eventually came, but not in my view, this is my personal view, not because of much of, of the effort uh, that both governments and international institutions put in that. A different story can be told about two other areas. One is financial cooperation, and, and Benoit already mentioned to that, I will not dwell on it. Certainly a lot of effort and resources and results were obtained uh, not to fulfill the, the, the complete agenda, but to make a lot of progress in some areas. And then there is another area which is often forgotten, but which I think is really important, and it's tax cooperation. Uh, tax cooperation especially related to information sharing, which laid a basis, including in Europe, for providing a better environment for achieving some form of cooperation, not so much in tax policy setting, which rates and which tax base, but especially in terms of fighting tax evasion, which remains a big problem and has been addressed more effectively, this is my view, uh, also because of those responses to uh, international pressure. After all, in a crisis, you need a lot of money to stop gap whatever is happening. And if you think of how much money you would have if there were no tax evasion in your country, then immediately you have an incentive to do more about that. And this was actually uh, effective uh, especially in the part of involving major emerging economies in accepting the exchange of information approach. Let me come now quickly to where we stand today. And this is where the elephant in the room that uh, Barry uh, politely introduced is, comes in. Now, we are in a post-crisis situation and the name of the game in international economic policy issues is trade rather than finance. Of course, there are with lots of financial issues on the board, but trade is the area where apparently there is more conflict than, uh, than in other areas. So my point is, it's more of a question than a statement. And, my, uh, and the question is the following. Suppose that the Trump approach evolves and lasts over time. It has time to build. Is that going to generate an incentive for more closed regionalism in the future? And therefore, readjust the comparative advantage distribution in, in spite of global value chains and uh, produce a picture, say, five to ten years from now where regionalism is back. If that is the case, just for a second allow me to consider that as a possibility, if that is the case, then uh, the, of course the financial and monetary implications uh, come in importantly. Uh, one can mention obvious, two obvious uh, consequences. One is that exchange rates between big regions will play a much larger role in uh, providing adjustment or separation or more integration depending on how they go in the longer term. And secondly, that regional instruments or institutions for monetary and financial policy will flourish. And, uh, we, Paul just mentioned some of the Chinese attitudes, but we have seen that already. So my point is that uh, 
uh, as a consequence of a big financial crisis and lack of conditions leading to better institutions, because I can hardly consider the current situation as one in which my list of conditions really hold. There is no, uh, there is no conditions for enhanced long-term cooperation available. There is a lot of uh, conditions for enhanced long-term conflict available. Uh, so if that is the case, then we are moving away in the longer term from a regime where multilateral institutions uh, flourish. So this leads me to my final point, uh, and, and leads me to the point that uh, Barry uh, proposed as a blue sky thought, which I, I really like very much. Are there chances that uh, there is a situation in which institution, technical institu or independent institutions are set up so that they can deal with key issues uh, which, such as landing of last resort intervention, which by definition have a global dimension even if there is a regional setup, so that have a glo more global responsibility. I wish this were the case. Let me end with an obvious and perhaps naive statement that in order to set up an independent non-political institution, you need a, little of po a lot of political effort. You need policymakers and governments who hold sovereignty to transfer a part of that to global institutions. So this is where we stumble again in the fact that unfortunately or fortunately we cannot deal without politics. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pierre Carlo. Let me finally turn to uh, Isabel. Isabel, you, you were probably writing the reports of which Pierre Carlo had to read <laughs> when you were at the IMF, but now you've moved to the uh, private sector, which is your, now your, your perspective. So please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Benoit. So it's a, it's a mixed blessing to be the last speaker after one day of uh, terrific uh, panels, but, uh, but, uh, but thank you anyway, and thanks to the organizers. So what I'm going to do is try to uh, summarize what uh, uh, has been said by the, by the previous speakers and, and provide uh, uh, my own perspective um, where I don't fully agree with them. So one way to summarize it would be to say during the uh, global financial crisis in 2008, we didn't have a playbook, but we had a few great leaders here and there, and everybody improvised, and it worked out reasonably well. Whereas Today, uh, we do have a playbook, but we're not sure it will work because on the one hand, on the sovereign side of things, we're not sure there will be willingness to use that playbook. That's sort of the Barry's argument. And on the GCIB uh, side, we have a great playbook, but it's completely untested. And if anything, the banks have become bigger. Uh, and also, by the way, that's only at the global level, but in Europe, uh, the cross-border cooperation in resolution is frankly not quite there, and if anything, we've gone backwards with renationalization of, of, of banking. So anyway, uh, making that the, uh, the overarching story, let me, let me focus more on the sovereign side because that's, uh, that's an area I know uh, a bit better. Um, mostly I agree with Barry that there are now big question marks on the willingness to, to, to use the toolkit. Um, I would just put the emphasis a little bit differently. When you, when you think of the, that the big contribution of the London summit was the coordinated fiscal stimulus, as I think both of you have said, uh, I think that's true. Uh, but if we think, you know, would it happen again, my guess is the US wouldn't be the country most concerned with uh, fiscal sustainability in the long term, at least judging from what they've been doing for the last uh, year or so. Uh, but more likely the opposition would come, like it did last time around, from Europe, and particularly from, from Germany. And Europe has a fiscal framework that would make it very difficult to embark in a massive fiscal stimulus operation uh, today, in one year, in two years. Uh, so, that's, that, so I agree, but source of the problem slightly different. Uh, in terms of the Fed swap lines, uh, again, for sure there's a question mark, but uh, I'd like to remind everybody, last time around, there were really two categories of uh, countries or central banks that got a swap line. There were the tier one, the ECB, SNB, and uh, uh, Bank of England of the world who got it almost without asking uh, because it was immediately obvious to the US uh, Federal Reserve and others that it was in their very own self-interest to get these uh, swap lines in place very quickly. 
And then you had another tier of countries, Brazil, Indonesia, uh, I forget a few, uh, Mexico, who got it, and that became a, a bargaining story. There was, and, and, and it was a very political decision at the end of the day, and I would bet the same thing exactly is gonna happen next time around. Um, then we come to IMF resources, and, and here I would, I would agree with Barry. To, to me personally, if there's one thing that worries me right now, uh, that is it. Uh, but again, with a slight nuance, what worries me is that if you look at the, what in the jargon is called the uh, forward commitment capacity, the, the money that the IMF is free to commit today, uh, it's $250 billion. You know, that's okay to deal with another couple of Argentinas, but you know, you really have to hope you don't have a, a seriously big country coming up with a problem. Now, there is another batch of resources, just above $500 billion, that are available if activated. Uh, this is the money that uh, Barry referred to is in the form of loans. And to activate these loans, uh, you need an 85% majority. And so the US has a veto. I think that's very much where the problem lies, I think. And again, if we're really in a systemic crisis, we have every reason to believe the US will do what it takes to uh, you know, not plunge the global economy into a worse mess than it's already in. But we've seen the US recently take a much more transactional approach to these questions, not a principled one. And so there could be a phase of bargaining to see what the US wants in exchange for activating this uh, these resources and, and time doesn't help in this, uh, uh, in this uh, situation. So, so that's, that's clearly a worry. Um, now, and, and the problem is, of course, we need these mechanisms because the world uh, hasn't actually deglobalized. Uh, global trade is at, uh, is at a historical uh, uh, height in terms of share of GDP. If you look at the last decade, cross-border portfolio holdings are as well. We are, in fact, much higher than 64% uh, uh, of, uh, of global GDP uh, by the latest data compared to 52% uh, in 2008. So cross-border bank claims have tapered off a bit, but everything else, we're more globalized, more integrated right now. So we need these mechanisms even more than, uh, than during the last crisis. So I would say that's the, that's the unfortunate part of the story. I think there are, however, some mitigating factors. As Benoit said at the outset, uh, there was quite a bit of progress made in the last uh, eight years or so in strengthening the, uh, the, the, the global uh, financial architecture. Some of that we worked on together, so that uh, brings uh, good memories. But I would say don't forget the last you know, six years because of you know, the last year and a half in the, in the, in the US, or the last two years in the, in the US. We still have a, a, a good system in place. The U.S. hasn't turned its back fully on global institutions. As far as I can tell, they still attend the G20. They still fight very hard in the communique sessions to not be finger pointed for being the bad guys or bringing down anything. Uh, so, so they're still they're still engaging. And then, most reassuringly, I really don't see anywhere else than in the U.S. even the temptation to turn the, 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 their back on multilateralism. In Bali, everybody was talking about more trade and what can we do to improve the WTO and have more trade and more cooperation among ourselves. And to some degree, there is, you know, the world can act without the U.S. And when you look at the breakdown of the, uh, the most recent pot of money, the bilateral borrowing arrangements of the, of the IMF, uh, the biggest contributor is China, and the U.S. isn't part of isn't part of the list of bilateral contributors. Europe is contributing a lot, but so these things can can evolve. And frankly, if the U.S. leaves a leaves a vacuum, others will fill it. And I think sooner or later, the U.S. will understand that it's probably not in their best interest to uh, to leave that uh, that vacuum. Um, and one, uh, yeah, one important thing I would like to say, that's not, not that I took it personally because I didn't write exactly that report, but, uh, but still pretty close. Uh, uh, one area I, I think in which the current international system is better prepared to deal with the next crisis than, than last time around is the IMF's uh, exceptional access policy, uh, to which several people referred to, in fact, yesterday as a potential model for the, uh, for the ESM going forward. This is something that wasn't adequate going into the crisis. Uh, the IMF realized in 2010 that the rules were so blunt that you basically had to choose between uh, two extremely bad solutions, 
uh, and as a result decided to change the policy in 2010 in order to lend to Greece and, and, and it, wasn't, it wasn't ignored, it was, it was changed and it was changed uh, so that worse outcomes couldn't be, uh, or rather could be avoided and then it was changed again more recently after more experience suggested actually it still doesn't work, we need three categories of debt sustainability, green, uh, grey and, and red uh, instead of two, so this is better. Um, and so I, I would just perhaps to, to conclude uh, touch on a few open questions that, uh, that haven't been discussed uh, in terms of how we look at crisis management going forward. The, the first one, and I'm really surprised it, it didn't come up, is the, the redistributive impact of bailouts just because there are no normal people in, in, in this room, just, uh, just uh, people who are part of the 1% and the policy makers. But when you look at the, the sort of the, the debate outside of this circle, people were pissed off about the bailouts and how much money ended up in the pockets of the bankers and the bonuses and, you know, even in, in, on the European side, uh, Hyun Shin uh, had this beautiful chart showing that, uh, you know, if the, if the European banks hadn't paid so much dividends, uh, they would be at equivalent level of, uh, of capitalization to the US banks. Um, and all these issues of, oh, you know, when Europe decided to force Ireland to bail out its banks so that, you know, you would bail out the, uh, in, well, not force, but basically have the sovereign take on the burden of, these, uh, of this failed uh, banking system in order to protect the French and German banking systems. These are, this is a reality. These are highly politically charged issues. They can't be swept under the rug, otherwise they come back to bite everybody. And that's why I think the idea of depoliticizing these, uh, these bailouts is, is highly problematic. I think, frankly, it would make things worse. And the, the mood of the man in the street is not to want more independent experts, it's to want less of them. Uh, so, so it seems to me, I mean, first of all, there's nothing new. The IMF is headquartered in Washington rather than New York for a, for a reason, and uh, has always been under pretty I mean, indirect political control, but uh, these are not these are not um, uh, neutral decisions. These are these are highly political decisions, and it seems right to me that they be made uh, uh, in a politicized way, as long as there are rules and some kind of uh, of predictability. Uh, last two points: we've talked a lot since yesterday about resolution. What about the pre-resolution context? Could, should more be done to discuss things like, you know, we had the Vienna Initiative the last time around in, uh, in Europe. Uh, obviously, banks are getting displaced by, by, by markets, but it seems to me that's perhaps something that would warrant uh, a bit more discussion going forward. You know, how do you come to a cooperative uh, approach to um, uh, essentially maintaining banks in place instead of all pulling out at the same time? Uh, third open question, what about non-banks? Um, and uh, so Peter mentioned asset managers earlier. I'm personally uh, very confident asset managers are, are wonderful and not, uh, not a systemic risk at all, but uh, there are others. Uh, CCPs is something that, uh, that, that, that worry us and uh, perhaps uh, warrant more attention. And the issues of market liquidity that were that was discussed earlier, again, uh, so far, it seems to work. There's, there's been, the system has adapted to the pullback of broker-dealers and their smaller uh, balance sheets, but, uh, but perhaps it would be good to, to stress test that a bit uh, rather than assume uh, everything will, uh, will work out. Uh, so just to conclude, I just want to bring that back to some implications and, uh, and lessons for, uh, for Europe. Uh, there is now a big question mark on the ability and willingness of the IMF to help out parts of the world that it doesn't see as it in its direct interest to help out. In other words, Europe really does need to make sure it can handle the next crisis in its core uh, when it happens, uh, take its fate into its own hands. Um, and maybe since this is the last panel, one issue that I, I, I felt was insufficiently discussed yesterday in terms of completing the safety net is the question of uh, the precautionary toolkit. Uh, that was another very positive, I thought, development in the international mm -hmm. financial architecture to develop precautionary tools. They're hard to do at the international uh, level because there is no uh, common view of what's an adequate policy framework, but in Europe we have that. We have the SGP for better or for worse, and countries are monitored for their compliance with it. And so in principle, it should be a lot easier to have a, a precautionary tool for which countries that 
are in line with the SGP, et cetera, can automatically qualify. And then that means you could actually deploy tools like OMT fairly easily if you ever need to, instead of leaving it in the uh, untested uh, box uh, and another question mark. So let me stop here. Thank you very much, Isabel. So we have a little bit less than 10 minutes for a discussion, which is, uh, which is good news. And I would like to thank you all for your uh, discipline. Um, so that shows that uh, ex ante uh, efficiency some, sometimes can be reached. Um, <laughs> is there, is there any, any pressing need uh, on the side of the, of, the, of the panel participants to comment on what has been said? I mean, if, uh, or should I give the floor now to the, uh, to the audience? So if anyone wants to ask a question. You're welcome, and please uh, introduce yourself. Okay. So that uh, tells you a lot about uh, the uh, aggregate utility function, I guess, between lunch and, uh, and questions. Yes, please, sir. We had first a gentleman here in the, in the middle. Thank you. Stasinopoulos, formerly with the European Commission. My question it's, uh, relates more with experience in the United States. So probably, uh, first of all, I would like to thank all the, the panel for very, very useful, important presentations. Fin financial markets, where stocks, bonds, and other assets are traded are growing large lately. There is some evidence, at least in the United States. And efforts that to micromanage, let's say, the large sums of money, they have one tendency or impact, among other things, to drive risky transactions, a risk towards the non-banking sector, which is not uh, regulated. I'm wondering for the panel, especially for Barry Ian Green and Patrick Bolton, if that's real evidence is substantial, uh, should we worry? And then what can be done given that the US administration is rather reluctant somehow to regulate the non-banking sector? Thank you. Let me collect maybe uh, a couple of other questions before we come back to the panel. Yes, uh, sir, here. Thank you very much, uh, Bernard Snow, for the Robert Riffin Association. Um, in uh, London in 2009, uh, one important element uh, was the, the creation of 250 billion uh, SDR uh, to, to add liquidity and help solve the crisis. Uh, nobody mentioned this as a, as a possibility in the future. How do you see that? Thank you. Thank you. Then we had the lady here. Thank you very much from the Erza Autre from the Austrian Central Bank. I have just a practical question because we were talking about shadow banking and non-bank sectors. What exactly uh, is meant by this definition? Is it uh, captive institutions or uh, SBEs or holdings? Because, yeah, just for clarification so we know what we are talking about. Okay, thank you. Is there one last question or comment? Mm, no, so let me come back to Bell. Patrick, you want to start? I think I can answer the, the questions about the um, non-bank non and uh, shadow banking sectors. Uh, uh, you know, I'll lump them together. So um, <clears throat> I, I'm going to make three points. Uh, the first point is that um, the uh, overall the shadow banking sector since the financial crisis has not grown at the expense of the regulated sector. It, it, it's remained, the shares have remained roughly constant. Um, the second point is that the, the, the history of U.S. financial regulation is one of competition between shadow banking and banking, except, you know, we, we use different terms. We had, Gla we had Glass-Steagall. Glass-Steagall separated investment banking from commercial banking. Investment banks were shadow banks. And what did we see in the crisis? We saw 
the vulnerabilities were in the shadow banking sector with broker dealers, investment banks. So this is an important issue. So how, what have we done about that? Well, one of the most uh, interesting new ideas that emerged from the crisis is um, Title I of Dodd-Frank. That means the creation of the Financial Stability Oversight Council, FSOC. Now, what's the role of FSOC? The role of FSOC is, the main role, is a designation role of non-bank institutions, financial institutions, as being systemically important. So FSOC designated Prudential, uh, was about to designate MetLife, it designated G Capital, uh, so a bunch of uh, uh, institutions have been designated as systemically important. That's the answer to risk buildup in the shadow banking sector, is this designation. It's a very important new creation. Unfortunately, the way the, way the politics are going, and in fact, actually, BlackRock uh, was in a, a bit of a cross, cross debates about this because uh, People mentioned maybe BlackRock is systemically important and should be designated, and then of course BlackRock communicated, no, no, asset managers are not systemically important. <laughs> so, so, but the point is the politics have gone to actually undermine FSOC. So right now there is no non-bank systemically important institution that had, is designated as systemically important. So Prudential is no longer designated, MetLife escaped. GE Capital uh, uh, is no longer designated. So, so um, that's a pity because I think that's the, the only instrument we have to, you know, to address a fundamental, fundamental concern. Thank you, Patrick. Um, Isabel? Uh, thank you. Uh, maybe I'll say, uh, maybe Barry, you want to talk about the SDRs, but I'll just say one, one thing on this. Uh, Unless one wants to ask the permission of the US Congress, the total amount of SDRs allocated cannot exceed the US quota, and the last quota increase wasn't large enough to allow for a meaningful SDR allocation, and frankly, it was already quite painful to get it done last time around. Uh, I'm not sure this would be the most effective way of, uh, of accomplishing anything at, at, at this time. I, I wanted to, since I have the floor, uh, ask you, Benoit, if you could react to uh, Barry's push for uh, having ECB swap lines uh, up and ready uh, for the next crisis, if I may. Um, no, I, 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 I can certainly react. Um, no, I mean, the, 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 that the discussion on central bank swap lines is, is an entirely legitimate discussion. Uh, central bank swap lines are part of the, of the global financial safety net. Uh, they, well, we like to say global financial safety nets so that, you know, uh, 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 it, uh, it can include different, different kind of instruments. Uh, and, um, and things have moved on. Things have changed. I mean, we now have this uh, uh, very uh, uh, significant network among uh, major central banks. Uh, which is which is being used. So we, I mean, it's uh, it's uh, it's uh, it's hardly known, but we actually do still do have a weekly dollar tender at the ECB. Uh, uh, it's not very much used, which is good news. Uh, last week was, I guess, 80 million euros, uh, which is very small, but it is there and it can be used. Uh, so uh, that is uh, that is a legacy from 2008, if you want, but it's still there and it's uh, it's up and running. Uh, and uh, we we have a swap line with China, for instance, uh, which is a very significant step that the ECB uh, at, and uh, almost at the same time the Bank of England uh, have taken. It's, it's a 45 billion euros uh, a swap line, uh, which is uh, which is significant. Uh, um, so uh, the, the two pitfalls here, I, th I, I would I would say, uh, and so and, and which call for caution, are first that. Um, we want to be sure that swap lines do serve a monetary purpose. Uh, and uh, I fully agree with the remark you made earlier, Isabel, uh, which is that uh, very often they've been caught in some kind of political bargaining. Um, and in some cases, uh, you can suspect that they've been used also for, uh, uh, um, uh, for purposes which have nothing to do with monetary policy nor with financial stability, uh, to support industrial policy, to support trade policy. And if this is the, the purpose, it may be totally legitimate, but then it's not for the central banks to do it, uh, because it's not part of our mandate. Uh, and it, it's a different discussion. Uh, and the second pitfall is relates to the assignment of tasks between central banks and, and the IMF. 
uh, and there, there has to be a clear assignment of tasks. So balance of payment financing is a role of the IMF. It's not monetary policy, it's something different. And the notion that there could be uh, some kind of substitution between IMF instruments of substitutability between IMF instruments and uh, monetary policy instruments, um, I, I believe doesn't serve a purpose because it blurs the, the responsibilities between the IMF and the, and the central banks. So that, that, that would be my two uh, caveats for any future discussion. And with that, uh, I thank very much uh, the, the panelists uh, and, the, and the audience. Uh, and Matthias, as, you, as you're the last uh, present member of the organizing committee, do you want to say a few words to close the conference? Yeah, if, if you can bring the mic. I'd just like to thank everybody for a great conference. I think. Uh, uh, I like what uh, Patrick and Paul said about the fact that we uh, didn't spend too much time uh, saying how great people were uh, 10 years ago, but that we are trying to be uh, realistic about indeed the fact that something has been achieved, but there is still more to do. And I thought uh, at least I enjoyed it a lot, and I hope you too, and uh, I think it's great. And. Uh, uh, thanks to the National Bank of Belgium, we can now proceed to lunch. Thank you. Thank you.